rising majestically from the Great Plains, like a garden of the gods, are the Black Hills of South Dakota. For thousands of years, prior to the coming of the white man, Native Americans utilized the Black Hills for ceremonial purposes and hunting grounds. Rough and wild, the Black Hills remained in a fairly primitive state until early this century. The natural beauty of the area evokes a sense of well-being in the beholder. Utter peace for the soul can be found beneath the sturdy arms of the Ponderosa Pines, which battle on nature's harsh terms for their own survival. It is the pines, after all, that gave the region its Indian name, Paha Sapa, or Hills Black. The hills themselves are breathtaking and splendorous in their own way. But for many today, there can be no doubt as to the reason for the notoriety of the Black Hills, the unmistakable allure of Mount Rushmore. This then is the story of Mount Rushmore, its creator, its benefactors, and its many craftsmen. It is also a story about the very soul of this great nation, a process of dreams, of toil, and an urgency to rework the world about us into something we hope is better for all. Above all else, it is the story of man himself as he continues to redefine his very being. The Black Hills are not really hills at all, but mountains that have been gradually weathering for the past 60 million years. At one time, the mountains stood about 20,000 feet above sea level, but wind and water, nature's agents of change, have eroded the once proud peaks. However, the remnants of those peaks are the molten cores of the very mountains themselves, what we know as granite, one of the most durable rock compounds known to man. It was precisely these granite outcroppings which attracted the attention of the first person central to the story of Mount Rushmore. His name was Doan Robinson. A well-respected South Dakotan, Robinson's dream was to carve a monument out of the granite in the Black Hills. His vision was to immortalize the likes of Lewis and Clark, the great Sioux chief, Red Cloud, or the great explorer and first presidential candidate of the Republican Party, John C. Fremont. When Robinson first conceived the vision is lost to history, but we do know that in December 1923, he wrote to Laredo Taft, a renowned sculptor of the day. Taft, however, was too ill to inspect the Black Hills and in due time suggested another sculptor, Gutson Borglum. In August 1924, Doan Robinson wrote to Gutson Borglum, who was, at the time, busy carving a memorial to Civil War heroes on Stone Mountain, Georgia. Borglum, at once, was taken by the project. In time, it would become his life's passion and crowning glory. In September, the sculptor made his first trip to the site, which would come to hold captive his very existence for the rest of his life. A better choice could not have been made. Gutson Borglum was born in 1867, the son of Danish immigrants. Both facts serve to better appreciate his roots. Initially, it can be said that he came of age when the days of the wild frontier were drawing to a close. Borglum was a romanticist and as such longed for the days of the open west. It is obvious by his work that the pioneer spirit captivated his interest. Secondly, the artist truly appreciated the opportunity that America gave to his parents and ultimately to himself. He was sensitive of this and never lost sight of it. Hence, when it came to expressing his innermost thoughts on canvas or in stone, Borglum sought to realize the moment of intensity in his work. Here was a perfect match. Robinson, the dreamer, and Borglum, the impassioned artist. However, there needed to be another major player in the game, 
Indeed, it is important to dream and equally as important to create. But the fruition of both cannot occur on a grand scale without public support, both political and economic. Enter Senator Peter Norbeck. Norbeck was another South Dakotan by birth. Like Borglum, Norbeck worked hard to fulfill the American dream, rising above near poverty through hard work and drive. After amassing a respectable fortune, Norbeck turned to politics, where his determination and honesty won the hearts of those whom he served. After a stint in the South Dakota Senate, Norbeck was elected governor in 1916. Four years later, he was elected to the U.S. Senate. However, Doan Robinson not only knew of Norbeck's interest in preserving the Black Hills, but also the senator's passion to promote the native beauty of the area. Very early in the process of organization, Robinson made sure that Norbeck was on board. Norbeck would not only join the effort, but would prove to be a pivotal person on many crucial occasions. In late September 1924, Borglum, his son Lincoln, who in time was to oversee his father's work, and Major Jesse Tucker, Borglum's assistant at Stone Mountain, came to the Black Hills to inspect the area for a suitable site. The three were met by Doan Robinson and a host of other South Dakotan dignitaries. After a horseback ride through the Needles, Borglum concluded that the site, the favorite of Robinson, was too weathered and irregular to sustain a carving of such magnificence. Nevertheless, Borglum was still enthusiastic about the prospect of such a carving. In August 1925, Borglum returned to the Black Hills determined to find a suitable rock for his monument. This time he found it. Mount Rushmore, so named after a New York City attorney, Charles E. Rushmore, was the perfect site that Borglum had been searching for. It was a large chunk of granite with tremendous artistic potential. It faced the southeast, which would provide for maximum exposure to the sun, a fact that was critical to the overall aesthetic effect of the completed work. Mount Rushmore was also isolated. Borglum wanted to situate the monument where it wouldn't be torn down for lesser purposes. This was indeed the opportune place. On October 1st, 1925, Borglum dedicated the mountain. As 3,000 people looked on, flags of Spain, France, the 13 colonies, and the stars and stripes were raised and lowered, an event which signified for Borglum the chronological progression of ownership of the mountain. A Sioux chief in full dress was situated on top of the mountain, along with impersonators of the European powers. Speeches were heard from Robinson, Norbeck, and Borglum. A band played. It was pageantry at its best. Sometime before the dedication, Borglum had become convinced that Robinson's theme, that being a Western one, was too confining. Better to enlarge the theme, the artist thought, to reflect the complex fabric of the American experience. For Borglum, the American dream was one of expansion. Washington, Lincoln, and Jefferson were debated as potential subjects. The choices were based in part on their contributions to the American nation. Furthermore, so as to make the finished work even more stunning, the artist chose to abandon the bas-relief art form. This particular design was suited to his work on Stone Mountain, but not for Mount Rushmore. Instead, Borglum chose an admittedly more difficult approach, one which, upon completion, would better project the intensity that he sought. Borglum decided that the sculptures would be carved in the round, which was no small task, considering the magnitude and ambition with which Borglum approached the project. It would be grand in its conception and bold in its design. Nothing quite like it had been tried before. The choice of subjects for Mount Rushmore is a story in itself. Borglum's intense patriotism is readily visible in the figures he selected for carving. 
Although the superficial reasons for the selections are well known, a reflective examination yields much more as to the complicated portrait of each man. For example, Borglum's choice of Washington met with little resistance, save from those who desired no carvings at all to be done on Mount Rushmore. After all, the artist reasoned, Washington was our first president under the Constitution, but he was much more than a chief executive. His persona, as seen today on Mount Rushmore, represents our vision as a nation, independence from Great Britain, a struggle to define our national consciousness, and a grasp of our place in history, all combined in the features of Washington, then and now. Washington would be the first figure completed, and of the four, the most prominent one. But like any human being, Washington epitomizes the paradoxical nature in all of us. He held high moral principles to be sure, and yet he owned numerous slaves, finally setting them free by decree only upon his death. Like Washington, Lincoln, as a subject, was hailed without opposition. Governing during the period of our most intense internal turmoil, Lincoln held firm to the principles of a united government. When many about him urged acceptance of a divided nation, Lincoln doggedly pursued reunification. Were he not so determined and ultimately successful, one might ponder the altered course of history, both nationally and internationally, with the absence of a United States of America. Lincoln should also be remembered as the president who worked to set the slaves free. His actions were bold, to be sure, but by his efforts, the idealism of the Constitution was better served. Then, too, in the true American spirit, Lincoln rose above his humble beginnings to the highest office in the land. In the end, the great emancipator paid for his public service with his own life. He gave freely of his own soul so that we, as a people, might live. But Lincoln, like Washington, presents a mixed picture. Although his main goal as president was to preserve the nation and its freedoms, to do so successfully required him to govern the Union during the Civil War in a dictatorial fashion. After Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson was chosen for his contributions in several areas. First, he was the primary architect of the Declaration of Independence the document which constructed the political framework for our government. Upon his ascendancy to the presidency, Jefferson worked diligently to maintain our independence by steering us clear of war with either Britain or France, even at the short-term expense of his own popularity, especially in the New England states. Finally, it was Jefferson who presided over the purchase of the Louisiana Territory an act which doubled the size of the United States and helped, in time, to complete our manifest destiny, the acquisition of land from the Atlantic to the Pacific. In fact, Mount Rushmore itself is positioned on part of the old Louisiana Territory. Of all choices, Theodore Roosevelt was the most controversial. Borglum and Norbeck were enthusiastic supporters of the Bull Moose ideals. Both men knew Roosevelt personally, and so it was natural to respect his many accomplishments. However, Roosevelt had not yet withstood the test of time, according to some critics. Better to wait, they argued, until history could better judge the late president. But Borglum was not one to wait for history or anything else if he could help it. Theodore Roosevelt was to be the fourth and final subject. For Borglum, Roosevelt constituted the very embodiment of the American spirit at the turn of the century. Confident, energetic, and robust, Teddy Roosevelt and the American nation strode into the 20th century in a purposeful, deliberate manner. It was Roosevelt, after all, who championed the dream and eventual construction of the Panama Canal. With its completion, brushing aside delicate political issues, International trade flourished, 
and America's personal interest in the growing empire were better served. In addition, Roosevelt was the first president to actively seek protection of rights for the working man. By his attention, he helped the nation to acknowledge the legitimacy of the labor movement and, in so doing, better the conditions of workers. Hence, for these reasons and more, Borglum chose Teddy Roosevelt for inclusion on Mount Rushmore. With the site dedicated and the figures finally chosen, Borglum's next important act was to attract national attention to his work for both political and economic reasons. In January 1927, President Calvin Coolidge received the first of many invitations to visit the Black Hills. It was hoped that with the president's support, funds could be raised more readily and that an appropriations bill pending in Congress but mired in committee could be passed which would guarantee the project's completion. Coolidge was lured to the area by his interest in farm programs, Guts and Borglum's work, and a keen love of trout fishing. President Coolidge came to South Dakota in June 1927 and stayed the summer. No detail was overlooked. Even the stream where Coolidge fished was appropriately stocked with trout prior to the president's visit. Throughout the summer of 1927, there was feverish activity on the mountain. Lumber, cement, dynamite, drilling equipment, even power lines, all had to be brought to or erected on Mount Rushmore before formal operations could begin. Borglum was determined that President Coolidge would formally dedicate the work on the mountain, and to do this, timing was critical. On August 10, 1927, President Calvin Coolidge did just as Borglum had hoped. The mountain was dedicated, public awareness was raised, and Borglum was in the spotlight. Silent Cal spoke briefly, but poignantly and prophetically. He said, The people of the future will see history and art combined to portray the spirit of patriotism. This memorial will be another national shrine to which future generations will repair to declare their continuing allegiance to independence, to self-government, to freedom, and to economic justice. After presenting Borglum with a set of drill bits, the artists scaled the mountain and began operations. Work was finally underway. Borglum's hope of increased private funding was soon realized. The presence of President Coolidge spurred this critical dimension of the project. Money came in from all over the United States, from service clubs, school children, and private individuals. Unfortunately, the artist himself was not fully attuned to the delicate nature of successful fundraising. Borglum was more concerned with the dynamics of the project than with its financial realities. At this juncture came another important figure, John A. Boland, yet another South Dakotan. Boland was a highly respected businessman who, as a boy, climbed Mount Rushmore on more than one occasion. He knew the area and the attitudes of the local citizenry. Money spent carelessly would not sit well with the locals. Although Boland and Borglum would vehemently disagree from time to time, both needed the talents of the other in the early going. Boland would prove to be the stabilizing financial force on the Mount Rushmore National Memorial Commission. The commission in time supplanted the Mount Harney Association which had been the original agency for the development of Mount Rushmore. One of the key figures on the Mount Harney Association was Governor William J. Bulow. During his tenure, Bulow would not only work out the thorny question of land acquisition and administration, state and federal land had to be released and reorganized, but would in time also introduce a major funding bill in the U.S. Senate upon his election to that body. Another political figure indispensable to the development of Mount Rushmore was Congressman William Williamson. More than anyone else, it was Williamson who proved to be a dynamic force during the drafting and eventual passage of Public Law 805 in 1929. The act not only created the Mount Rushmore Memorial Commission, 
but provided $250,000 in matching funds for the construction of the monument. And so, with the passage of Public Law 805 in February 1929, all seemed well. No one could have foreseen the impending disaster of October and its subsequent impact on the project. By the end of 1929, the United States was firmly in the grip of the Great Depression. Funding would become increasingly difficult, but through it all, there was Borglum, publicly unshaken, confidence intact, urging, cajoling, and enthusiastically championing the project. It had long since ceased to be just another commission for Borglum. It was now the defining element of his life. Work had begun in earnest in 1927, but by 1929, the process was interrupted innumerably by one unmistakable need, money. Although the project would, in the final analysis, take 14 calendar years, had the work not been interrupted, it is estimated that it could have been completed in six and a half years. No matter how slow or how fast, the project nonetheless progressed. When Guts and Borglum worked on the Stone Mountain project, he had experimented somewhat with the possibility of using dynamite to sculpt. At Rushmore, this art, as it came to be, was refined and reached new levels of perfection. The process itself was relatively simple. After crafting a model in plaster, Borglum would simply replicate the model in stone. Every inch on the model corresponded to one foot on the mountain. Borglum first took a measurement in the studio. Then, by using a boom which swung out over the mountain, he measured and correlated the features from his plaster models onto the face of the mountain and painted instructions on the rocks to his men. The controlling device was the pointing process, as it was called, whereby miners who did the blasting were able to sculpt by the numbers. Although the procedure was slow at times, it was amazingly accurate, a fitting tribute to the sculptor. From small bits to huge boulders, rock was blasted from the mountain and left to accumulate at the base. After enough stone was blasted away, the men constructed scaffolds. Air-powered tools were used to remove the last six inches of granite. Holes were drilled in the rock in a honeycomb fashion, and using wedges and hammers, the stone was broken off. The final three inches of granite allowed the sculptor to make final adjustments. As William Bulow said in 1947, no other man has ever had the perspective to carve such gigantic figures and make them look natural to the human eye from any spot below. It takes a genius to figure out the proper perspective so that the carving will look right from the point from which the human eye beholds them. Gutzon Borglum was that genius. As the carving process neared completion, the scaffolds were removed and the men were able to work in bosun chairs suspended from above. When the desired effect was reached, a pneumatic bumper, much like a jackhammer, was used to finish the surface to the texture of a sidewalk. This permitted delicate touch-ups to be completed and also gave the carvings a polished look. It is estimated that 90% of all the carving was done with dynamite. Carefully, purposely, and gradually, from the mountain came the likeness of Washington. At first, the miners, who were merely working to make a living, were anxious to blow massive chunks from the granite surface. In time, however, these rough men developed a sense of purpose from their work and grasped their potential contribution to history and the preservation of the American dream. Take, for instance, the story of Otto Anderson. Red, as he was called, had no money and no employment in the summer of 1929. He came to Keystone with three dollars in his pocket, a wife and a daughter to support, and raw ambition as his experience. After a short stint plastering Borglum's studio, Anderson was offered work as a rough driller for 50 cents an hour. He accepted and consequently began a career 
which would last until the final days of 1941. Alton Leach, better known as Hoot, also came to work on the mountain in 1929. He too would remain until the end. For Hoot, the sacrifice would be great. In 1956, he would die of silicosis, a lung disease caused by the granite dust. There were others, of course, who came to Mount Rushmore. Some, like Red Anderson and Hoot Leach, stayed on attracted by Borglum and his dream. But to a man, all were forever changed by their experience on the mountain. This metamorphosis in self-definition is still readily visible in their work. As a group, they became sculptors. Their legacy lives on through the monument they created. The whole process, from beginning to end, linked Borglum, affectionately known as the chief, to the workers. Thus, united in purpose, and determined to create a masterpiece beyond compare. The men who would ultimately shape the mountain worked together in unison and relative harmony. But both would pay a heavy price for their efforts. For Borglum, rather than live in comfort, as a man of his immense talents could have done, it meant financial sacrifice. In fact, after the sculptor's death, his family was forced to pay off the debts that he had accumulated. As for those who toiled on the mountain, work was hard. In the early going, the men would climb the 760 steps to the top of the mountain before their workday officially began. The work was hot in the summer and bone chilling in the winter, with some recorded temperatures of 25 to 30 degrees below zero. But above all else, the work was dangerous. Although there were never any casualties during the project, Borglum was a fanatic when it came to protecting his men. However, in later life, a number of the men like Hoot Leach developed silicosis. The men did possess goggles and respirators, which helped, but such devices were not always used. Some of them died as a consequence. Women, too, helped in the carving of Mount Rushmore. Their help as support personnel proved to be invaluable and in many ways was just as challenging as the men who carved the mountain. But no matter the weather, the danger, or the granite dust, work continued on Mount Rushmore. After almost three years of blasting, toil, and carving, Washington's figure was ready to be dedicated on Independence Day 1930. 2,500 people watched as a huge flag was pulled away from Washington's likeness. Although it was not the finished figure that greets today's visitor, it was nonetheless breathtaking and awe-inspiring. It was just the psychological lift that the project needed. In late August 1936, another president, this time Franklin Roosevelt, came to the Black Hills. It was FDR, the New Deal Democrat, who dedicated the figure of Jefferson, an earlier Democrat. An estimated crowd of 3,000 was present to witness the event and to hear Roosevelt. I think that we can perhaps meditate a little on those Americans 10,000 years from now when the weathering of the face of Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln shall have proceeded to a depth of perhaps a tenth of an inch. 10,000 years from now, I think we can meditate and wonder whether our descendants, because I think they'll still be here, what they will think about us. And let us hope that at least they will give us the benefit of the doubt that they will believe that we have honestly striven in our day and generation to preserve for our descendants a decent land to live in and a decent form of government to operate under. The Lincoln Head was the next to be dedicated in 1937. On September 17th, the day which marked the 150th anniversary of the Constitution's adoption, 
5,000 spectators listened intently to the oratory of Senator Edward R. Burke of Nebraska. At the appropriate moment, the flag which covered Lincoln's head swung away to reveal a gaunt and bearded figure of the great emancipator. The remaining head was dedicated on July 2nd, 1939. Theodore Roosevelt would have been pleased by the grandeur allotted him during this ceremony. An evening event, nothing was overlooked as this particular date was also the 50th anniversary of South Dakota's statehood. Roughly 12,000 visitors were on hand for the extravaganza. By this time, Borglum was busy continuing his work on the Hall of Records. Borglum felt that the monument required a repository of records of the Western world's accomplishments, the political effect of its philosophy of government, its adventure in science, art, literature, invention, and medicine. Today it stands, still unfinished, behind the monuments. Time, enthusiasm, and funding would all combine to thwart the capstone to his work. A few short weeks after the Roosevelt dedication, Europe plunged into World War II. America's attention, once riveted on the project in the Black Hills, now looked across the ocean. And as our attention waned, so did funding, a necessary ingredient for the completion of the work. In early 1941, Guts and Borglum boarded a train in Rapid City, which would take him to Chicago. He was to undergo a minor operation. But on March 6th, the sculptor died as a result of complications from surgery. Responsibility for continuation of the project, as Guts and Borglum would have wanted, fell to his son, Lincoln. For the rest of 1941, young Borglum sought to phase out work on the project. October 31st, 1941, was the last date of activity on the mountain during the formal construction period. An era had ended. A formal dedication of the entire mountain would wait for two world wars, Korea, Vietnam, and nine presidential administrations. On July 3, 1991, the 50th year after the cessation of work on the mountain, yet another president journeyed to South Dakota. President George Bush came to formally dedicate Mount Rushmore. Like Coolidge before him, Bush took refuge in the cool, quiet hills. And once again, trout were strategically stocked, this time in Horse Thief Lake, where the president fished. What does Mount Rushmore mean to us today? Guts and Borglum knew exactly what it meant for him. He said, I want, somewhere in America, a few feet of stone that bears witness to the great things we accomplished as a nation. Carved high, as close to heaven as we can. Then, breathe a prayer that the wind and rain alone shall wear them away. But what message does it send forth? Why, after all, do over two million visitors a year, Americans and numerous other nationalities, crowd into this memorial? What calls us to this shrine, this icon of America? Do we come to witness for ourselves the accomplishments of Borglum and his staff? Do we come in search of our democratic roots? Are we merely curious? Perhaps the answers are as varied as the visitors who journey to the memorial each year. For most, however, Mount Rushmore symbolizes our collective national heritage. On one level, it is the culmination of a dream on a grand scale. This, of course, is part and parcel of the American experience. On another level, it represents our struggle to become independent, to grow, to endure hardship, pain, and suffering, so as to emerge stronger and more attuned to righteousness. Deeper still, it reflects one man's attempt to leave behind something permanent for the ages, something which transcends his earthly being. For others, it reflects in its unfinished state the manner of our government, 
imperfect yet constantly seeking to make itself better. We have grown as a nation. We have made strides toward eliminating discrimination, bigotry, and hatred. But we have far to go. And finally, at its deepest sense, Mount Rushmore reaches out to touch the soul, like Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson, and Roosevelt. We are all filled with high ideals, and yet, at times, strive for them paradoxically. Do we not, as surely did they, struggle with a reconciliation between philosophy and practice? In this tranquil surrounding, far from the crowded cities, one can commune with a greater power so as to address the complexities of life. One can be humble within the shadow of the carvings which Borglum so painstakingly created. It is then this inner peace and harmony, the sense that all is well, which radiates warmth from the seemingly cold stone. Mount Rushmore is a balm for the modern man. Guts and Borglum can rest with his destiny. Rushmore is truly a shrine for all generations, then, now, and always.